you, Dr. Baker. Next up, we have Deborah Parks, who's joining us again from the Washington University in St. Louis, who's going to give an overview on musculoskeletal manifestations of sarcoidosis. Good morning. So, this morning, um, I'm going to talk about the musculoskeletal manifestations of sarcoidosis, but I have to explain a little bit about why I think rheumatologists bring a little bit more to the table for sarcoidosis than just talking about bone and joint disease. So, probably the first question that I get from a sarcoid patient when they're referred to me is, why is an arthritis specialist seeing me? Seems kind of odd, right? So you have to understand a little bit about what rheumatologists do. I mean, we don't just take care of joints. We consider ourselves immunologists. So that's usually the first question that I, I get from a sarcoid patient. And, and I have to say that in, in, if I think about the most common reason that I see sarcoid patients, it rarely has to do with musculoskeletal manifestations. I do see it, but it's not a very common uh, manifestation and so my role is really more about management and treatment and that's because when you look in your brochure at the menu of all the drugs used for sarcoidosis I hate to say it but they're hand-me-down drugs for my specialty for the most part um, because they come from the world of rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, other autoimmune disorders. So many times I'm serving as a resource to my colleagues who might not have as much experience with them. Uh, and I hope that someday I can stand here and say that we have a sarcoid-specific drug. So on that note, um, what do autoimmune rheumatic diseases share in common with sarcoidosis? Because that is something that rheumatologists uh, uh, bring to the table. So I think the main thing is most of the diseases that I treat are inflammatory disorders of unknown cause, which is probably the most common thing that they share in common. We don't even know if sarcoid is really an autoimmune disorder. It, it may uh, be suggested by abnormal labs, so sometimes when the diagnosis is unknown, patients are sent to us to sort out, is it lupus, is it sarcoid, is it both? Um, one thing that they share in common is many times there's more than one organ system involved. But probably the most common is lung involvement, so our pulmonologists spend a lot of time managing sarcoid when it's isolated to the pulmonary system. But sarcoid can occur in combination with other autoimmune disorders, so rheumatoid arthritis can coexist, lupus, occasionally scleroderma, um, as well as even celiac disease. So again, the most current treatment of sarcoidosis is steroids, and I think we're all pretty familiar with that. I think most of you sitting here would like to not have to use steroids on a regular daily basis, and that's where immunosuppressive drugs, where rheumatologists have a great deal of expertise, uh, come in common, and we would love to not have to use prednisone every day, but I think more importantly, the key is finding a sarcoid-specific drug someday. So again, just this is uh, going through trying, when I see a patient, I like to put everything together. And, and I think all of us need somebody to sort of centralize things and try and not uh, have uh, a specialist for every body part. So I try and uh, put everything together and try and coordinate with my colleagues and help look at the entire picture and not just a single organ system. So many patients come to us, they simply have a painful red eye. One of our ophthalmologists has seen them. They know they have a condition called uveitis. They're not quite certain that they have sarcoid at that point, but they then might pick up a cough and somebody does a chest x-ray and all of a sudden, gee, things are starting to get a little more suspicious for sarcoid. Then our third most common organ system, skin. So if somebody happens to notice that suddenly a scar has raised up or a tattoo, they might see the dermatologist and, aha, now we have something to biopsy. This is looking like sarcoidosis. We just talked about the nervous system where it might present initially or as part of the whole picture. It can occur in the GI tract with enlarged liver or spleen. It might affect the kidney but 
somebody needs to put everything together, and so that's sometimes where my role uh, may become important, and any one of my colleagues here could also step in the center, but this morning, since it's all about me, I'm going to bring it up. <laughs> so, on that note, I'm going to segue a little bit into musculoskeletal manifestations of sarcoidosis. So again, it's not so common. The acute presentation is, but many times by the time I'm seeing a sarcoid patient, the Lerfgren's that was alluded to in the, the first uh, talk, it's probably been there and gone because the erythema nodosum may resolve very, very quickly. But an astute clinician will look at someone's legs and if they see that they have dark spots, because what happens once that inflammation has been there, it can leave hyperpigmentation or dark color and the pain is long gone. Many times those swollen lymph nodes in the beginning don't cause any symptoms whatsoever. Uh, and so again, it can get overlooked if the only manifestations were the enodosum and somebody just thought it was a rash of some sort. Um, but if your ankles are swollen and painful and you can't walk, you're going to go into the doctor. And so when that happens, that may be a real key. So particularly when we see swollen red angles, that gets our attention that we need to be thinking about sarcoid and doing a chest x-ray, even if there's no symptoms whatsoever. So when I talk about arthritis and sarcoid, if we break it up into acute arthritis and chronic arthritis, the acute could be this Lerfgren's uh, syndrome. Sometimes we'll see more isolated swelling, so we can see something called dactylitis where a finger or a toe looks like a little Vienna sausage, and it comes and goes. Chronic arthritis can occur, but it's not that common, and it can look exactly uh, like rheumatoid arthritis. So in this picture, this is what erythema nodosum can look like and be fairly subtle. You can see that it just, this isn't gonna show up, um, but basically up in the upper part, you can see that the leg just looks shiny and red and it's exquisitely painful. Um, and again, we rarely do have to do uh, biopsies of this unless it's confused with uh, some other process going on, so occasionally it might. Um, the chronic arthritis, you can just see big, swollen, puffy hands. And when that happens, there's a very wide differential that this could be. Anything from rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Lyme disease, and so again, um, it depends upon the duration of time uh, and a lot of blood tests and evaluation before a diagnosis of sarcoid could be made. Uh, and again, distinguishing that from some of our other systemic rheumatic disorders often comes uh, to our attention. This is an example of an isolated chronic arthritis that's just occurring in a single joint. And it's matched up with the x-ray. I don't know if you can appreciate so the long finger there where the bone looks totally white is normal, but if you look over to the side, you can see cysts in the bone that have occurred as a result of that chronic swelling that with treatment can often be prevented. So I've talked about the joint presentations, but you can have isolated bone involvement. And probably one of the biggest pleasures uh, in some of the sarcoid patients that I've treated is to be able to tell them that they do not have metastatic cancer because it often mimics that. And that's because it can occur in the pelvis and spine. Um, I recently saw a patient who had been told that she had metastatic breast cancer based on her bone scan, and she did have breast cancer. Uh, but when she didn't respond to therapy and someone got smart and did a bone biopsy and found it was sarcoid, it suddenly changed the staging of her cancer. And uh, that was good news. So the bone involvement, though, can be completely asymptomatic and it may not always require treatment. And again, we look at pattern recognition. I think the single biggest thing we don't understand is why do some sarcoid patients get certain organ involvement, if it's just eye and lung, or whether it's joint and lung. We don't understand what causes those different presentations, and recognizing those different phenotypes, I think, uh, becomes important. But we do know that in comparison to sarcoid patients without bone involvement, 
that those who do have bone involvement tend to have higher calcium levels, they tend to have enlarged lymph nodes or high lymphadenopathy, and they're more apt to have other forms of lung and skin involvement. But in general, the bone involvement does respond well to prednisone. Oftentimes, we can use methotrexate uh, to prednisone spare patients, and it can work quite well. More often, though, treatment itself can lead to osteoporosis, and so we need to monitor that as we're following patients. We think that osteopenia may occur as a result of the disease itself, but oftentimes that's not looked for prior to steroid treatment, so we're still trying to distinguish that. And you'll hear more about that uh, later on. So again, this is an example of a patient who had uh, evidence of sarcoid in their pelvis, if you look at the bone scan in the middle, those dark spots kind of in the pelvis were areas where uh, the patient was subsequently found to have sarcoid on the biopsy on the left. Again, another picture of the, the classic granuloma. And on plain films, this looked like cysts or lesions in the bones that could be con uh, confused with cancer. So this is an example, you've seen some pictures earlier of lupus perneo. That doesn't mean it's a form of lupus. Again, lupus just means wolf-like. And so this patient has rash across the cheeks so that it gives them the appearance of a wolf. But they also have skin lesions around the nose. Many times when we see that, there can be bone infiltration of the, the, of the nose from sarcoid, so we have to look for that or in the upper respiratory tree, so some patients will get involvement of their trachea or windpipe and it can cause um, a change in vocal quality. Um, and again, I have to tell success stories. I had a patient who looked very similar to this and she had had such narrowing of her windpipe that when she talked she sounded like Darth Vader. And I, had, I didn't realize, you know, I knew it wasn't her normal voice, but after treatment with infliximab, she came in to see me, and, and I, didn't, I, I couldn't recognize her speech. She was actually a soprano, and she was able to go back to singing in the choir, uh, and it was just amazing. So, so the final type of musculoskeletal involvement is muscle involvement, and this can be very, very confusing. Um, it usually involves the shoulder and the hip girdle muscles. I would say that it is more common to see painful muscles than actual weakness, but, but it can in more severe cases. It can cause profound weakness and look like some of the inflammatory muscle diseases that I treat. Um, but it's also a site where we sometimes can uh, do a biopsy even when there are no symptoms there in cases where we suspect sarcoid, uh, where it's relatively non-invasive. I think the thing that distinguishes it is that many times the typical blood tests we run for muscle involvement are normal, and yet that doesn't exclude muscle involvement. So many times I've seen patients who've been told they have fibromyalgia, they're crazy, um, and actually that they had muscle infiltration from sarcoidosis. I think the bigger thing is sometimes in patients who are already being treated with steroids, um, trying to distinguish whether the prednisone is actually causing the muscle weakness or whether it's the sarcoidosis itself, and that's sometimes a difficult thing. Um, and so again, this can be a confusing picture that requires a multidisciplinary approach. So, in conclusion, uh, although musculoskeletal issues and sarcoidosis are rare, I'm just going to take one from my uh, specialty and say we still think we're important in diagnosis and treatment and we're happy to be able to help you. Thank you.